Amazing when you look at them, could be from about 1910. And I just cried, we were going to win the game. I was just so relieved it hadn't been a disaster, which I thought it would be um, with me as captain. England, France had been so vicious and, and violent for a, sort of five years and suddenly a really good night in a bar. I remember a lot of the guys afterwards just going, they're good guys actually, they're really good guys. I don't think they said that about us, but you know, we said that about them. Hi, I'm Will Carling and these are my Jersey Tales. So if we start with this one, quite special. <laughs> my first one is, uh, as England captain against Australia, 22 years old, I was absolutely petrified. Um, amazing when you look at them, could be from about 1910. But I remember going off um, with about two minutes to go, and sitting in the change room and I just cried. We were ahead, we were going to win the game. I was just so relieved it hadn't been a disaster, which I thought it would be. Um, with me as captain, so it was just a huge relief. And luckily, I dried my eyes before any of the players came back in, so I could pretend that, you know, obviously I was absolutely okay. I got captain in the January, and this game was in, in the November, and we, we weren't doing very well. I think we won two games in the then, you know, Five Nations. We, we toured Australia and lost both games. <laughs> we were underperforming, and I remember when Jeff Cook told them, we were sitting in the team room at the team hotel, that I, I would be captain. Um, there was just silence in the room um, and I was just sitting there like, oh, this is, this is awkward. And they all filed out. I remember years later asking, there was a guy, Peter Winterbottom, who was basically one of my heroes, teammate. I said, they all wandered down to the bar, as you did in those days. I said, what did everyone say? And they said, well, he said it was basically like a, a, a betting shot. We were like, how long? How long did you give him? And we were like two, three games, four games max. <laughs> Geez, I remember when I was six or seven sitting in front of Grandstand and listening to the music and watching England play in the, in the Five Nations as it was then and, you know, it was my dream um, to, to play for England, I never thought I would. I was as passionate putting this on as, as, as a Welshman was putting on a red jersey or a Scotsman, a, you know, a blue jersey or an Irishman, a, a green jersey and I, I wanted to be as passionate, I wanted us to be as passionate about playing for England as they were, um, about playing for their countries and in a way, I think that's always misunderstood. You know, Englishmen who are passionate are regarded as arrogant, whereas, you know, Welsh and Scots and Irish, they're all allowed to be passionate. We're not. And that really frustrated me because I am. I wanted to win in this every time I wore it. Oh, hey, I, I'm biased, but I think they're just iconic shirts because they're, you know, it's the plain white, it was the, the old rose that's changed a bit. And I certainly, having been back involved with the current squad, but just talking to guys who came after, they go, Geez, I would love to have played in a, in a plain white shirt. It just, you know, there's something about it. There's nothing else on it apart from this. And it's, um, they're quite special. Right, so we go back slightly in, in this great French shirt from the World Cup, bizarrely, of Philippe Seller, one of the great centers that I played against. It was. Basically goes back to my, my first cap, um, I played against him in Paris. Playing against him, who at the time was probably the best centre in the world. Um, and uh, in Paris, and you were just like, oh wow. I, I mean, um, I only thought I'd play once. So, uh, managed to play a few times and this was from the 95 World Cup, which was the last time I played against him. Um, and they won, unfortunately. This game, um, which I thought was why I should keep his shirt because he was just a truly brilliant player. That period, England, France, um, from sort of 1991, um, became the crunch. It was probably the most violent games of rugby that we played, um, that, that were played. I mean, it became really an unbelievably intense game, and, and it was only after this game that we, uh, we lost to them. And we ended up, we went to this bar in, in Pretoria, it was in South Africa, and we started drinking and they arrived. And we, had, we I mean, geez, the, the stuff that had gone on in games was, was unbelievable. And suddenly, you know, there was the language barrier, but we started drinking with them. Um, still couldn't talk to each other, but you sort of, you know, after a few beers, you somehow, you muddled through them. Had a great night and it was almost like when all that animosity just started to drift away because we were like, 
actually, you're a really good guy. And, and, and I think England, France have been so um, vicious and, and violent for a, sort of five years. And suddenly, just an evening, a night, a really good night in a bar, drinking beer. And, and it was just one of those great moments where it was just like, I remember a lot of the guys afterwards just going, they're good guys, actually, they're really good guys. I don't think they said that about us, but you know, we said that about them. When it comes to centres, this guy is probably the, the toughest centre I played against, um, Frank Bunce. <laughs> he used to hit you hard and late, and it was just one of those stupid things where you just thought, well, I'm not going to let him know that that hurt. Um, so you obviously didn't want to complain to the referee because that meant that he had got to you. So you just used to look at him and you'd just go, so you just look at him and go, and you spend the whole day whole game just going and thinking, Christ that hurt, um, but not showing it. And at the end of the game, swap shirts. And um, he just used to go, fair play. Um, but he was, he was a hell of a player, but um, he always knew you had been in a hell of a bloody game when you played against him. Frank Bantz is sliding his way through. First time I played against the All Blacks was the 91 World Cup and, and we lost. And we came across them again in, in 93 and we managed to beat them um, at Twickenham. And then the last time I played them was, was the 95 World Cup and there was a certain Joan Aloma who uh, <laughs> caused wrecking havoc. How do you stop this fellow Lomu? I'm hoping not to see him again myself, but uh, if we do, I think we'll have to work at that one. He's awesome, he's a freak. And the uh, sooner he goes away, the better. With Jonah, it was, you know, we'd watched tapes on him and we made the classic mistake in the build up to the semi final of trying to treat him as a, as a normal player. And I remember, Standing in the tunnel, Cape Town's a, it's a it's a thin tunnel. In World Cups, it was the first time you used to wait for each other and used to line up next to each other. Um, so and we'd got there first. So I'm waiting, and then obviously the New Zealanders arrived, and I remember Fitzy was at the front. But you do that thing in rugby. I don't know where you don't look at each other. I don't know why. And eventually, I got annoyed because you know we were being made to wait, and I sort of turned to see where the referee was, and my eyes sort of went over about the first three New Zealanders, and then over this huge hulk. Um, of Joan Loman, and you were just thinking, oh my God, but you're trying to tell your face, don't show any emotion, no reaction. And I remember standing in, in, the, in the tunnel looking forward, just thinking, what is that? He was unbelievable. And, and uh, four tries when he scored that game, it was, that, was, that was the end of our World Cup. Last year, one of my last for England, it changed a bit all the colours and stuff, but still got this. Our two youngest, the two youngest boys, they were probably nine and six, something like that. And the nine-year-old came home one day and he said, my mate's dad said that he used to play for England. And I looked at him and I went, you know, oh, hey, you know, I said, it doesn't matter, does it? And he goes, well, did you? And eventually I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I did, a long time ago. And, you know, he said, have you got any shirts? I said, oh, you know, no, you know, they're, they're upstairs, they're in the loft. And, Eventually, Lisa said, well, you know, get a shirt. So I, you know, got one of these shirts. It's funny how different they are, obviously. And he was sort of looking at it. And, and our youngest, you know, Jack was sitting there and he said, so did you ever play at Twickenham? And I said, yeah, once, or, once or twice. I said to Jack, do, do you want to have a look at it? And he just went, no. He said, you didn't play for England. And I said, all right, why not? He said, because you're my dad and you're too fat. And just got up and left. <laughs> and I just lay on the floor, killing myself laughing. And I thought, that's the way it should be. I remember going back to Sedba maybe five years ago to give a talk at the prep school and I was talking about it and it actually got quite emotional. And even Lisa said, you know, I start talking about what it means to me, what it meant to me. It was just massively important to me to play and, and, and to try and leave this in, in, in better shape than, than when, I, when I took it on. I think if, if that's what guys can do when they play, you know, we, we have a great legacy and we have great teams because there's a huge amount of talent. But, that's what it was about for me. I was, I was hugely honoured to wear it. I wanted to win in it. Um, but most of all, you know, I sort of, I, I wanted to do, I, I wanted to do it proud. So thank you for watching my Jersey Tales and um, let me know what you think in, in the comments below.